where it's growing. Because I don't think it is growing. Now, I might be wrong, but I don't think it's growing. The, the same faces that I see are the same faces that are here. The same faces that are in all the other organizations, like uh, Regenerative International, which is, we, Belize has a chapter now, which is Regenerative Belize. The, I mean, Mary is there, Sparkle is there, Dot is there, Karen is there, Bath is there. Then we go to the BTB meetings to promote natural eating and natural, and it's the same people again. So I think we're very unsuccessful. And we have, to, we have to acknowledge that. We're not succeeding. If we're not growing, we're not succeeding. It's, it's like if I go to the Catholic Church and I start to talk about God, they all already know that. That's why they went there anymore on Sunday morning. So if you, how do we grow an organization like Poor Organic that is willing to grow within our communities and then seed other organizations that are like Poor Organic throughout the country. How do we do that? That's a difficult thing. Now I'm also asked to, to talk about the underutilized crops. And then we're also asked to talk about soil fertility. And I think they all go hand in hand. You, you cannot really separate. Now, if I look in this room, now I honestly I don't mean any offense to anybody, okay? But I'm very I'm very liberal with my words all the time. Now this room is mostly made up of in plants to Belize. So, for us to talk about underutilized crops in a group like this is next to impossible. It's like bashing my head against the wall. Because if I, if I give you a native crop, what do you do with it? Because as little children you do not consume it. It is very, very difficult unless you are like-minded people and it says, like, it is directed to like-minded people. How do I convince somebody that I can make something else out of sweet potato that is non-traditional. Why, why is somebody not making noodles or pizza crust or cakes and, and all, everything that we're doing with wheat, why are we not doing it with sweet potato? So if, if a CSA is developed, like what programming has, and we give you sweet potato every week, every week you say, oh, when are we going to have potatoes? Well, unless we import them, then we'll have them or we have them in a short window in which we can grow them. And that applies to everything in the tropics. Everything. And I think why we have been unsuccessful is because we're trying to grow things that are not easy to grow in the tropics because they're not native to the tropics. That doesn't mean it can't be done. That doesn't mean it can't be done. It can be done, but at what cost? How much energy do we have to put into this? How much technology do we have to put into How much effort? The know-how is constantly, constantly changing to grow a non-traditional crop. So everybody wants romaine lettuce. Everybody wants kale. Those are from cold countries. So we need to focus, if we are to grow, and, and I, say, I repeat now, these are my opinions. These are my opinions. We need to be able to transform our diet completely, not partially. And there's another important aspect of, of a CSA which is not being addressed by pro-organic. Now, I will say, I think pro-organic has been successful because of the people who have driven it. But there are also like-minded people who are either vegans or vegetarians. And there's an important aspect of agriculture that's not being addressed, that other parts of society probably would like to integrate. Eggs, cheese, meat. And all of these are, we, we have to be able to embrace all of these different likes and, and eating uh, uh, habits, our diets and so forth, and integrate it. Everybody has their morals and ethics why they eat in a certain way. But it doesn't mean that those who enjoy a steak can't have a grass-fed steak, like Mr. Clayton here, who is grass-fed. It doesn't mean grass-fed is a steak, I'm just saying as an example. <laughs> so how, how do we do all of this and at the same time incorporate the communities and get them growing. It is definitely not by having a group like this. Definitely not. Because these groups will not expand. If in five years we've, we've kept with, I think between 30 and 40 members, is that right? The, 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 the buying members. Mm -hmm. uh, then, then we're not growing. Yes, ma'am. I was going to let everyone know that on Facebook, we're about one or two people shy 
roughly 500 people that are good followers, and they can't all come to meetings, but they are like liking folk. Uh, if we had 500, now I'm going to be the devil's advocate here. If we had 500 people participating, you wouldn't have me here. So following something and liking something and doing something in social media is not working in the, on the planet. You have millions of people saying that, oh yeah, let's save the planet. Oh yeah, let's talk about carbon footprint. But that's how we're doing, talking. Nobody is exercising. Nobody is going that extra mile, which is absolutely necessary to achieve what pro-organic wants to achieve. And that is to have a healthy diet. At the end of the day, not everybody has to show up at a meeting. All we want is that you're buying healthy food, that you're requesting healthy food on the market. And we can redefine what healthy is. Now for that, everybody says, oh, it's the Chinese. Oh, no, <laughs> we choose to buy at the Chinese. We, we are making those choices. Anyway, that's just, well, I wanted my little introduction. Now I'm going to talk about soil fertility and growing in Belize. The young lady here, what was your name, sorry? <coughs> Joanne. Miss Joanne says that she has just moved to Cristo Rey and she wants to start a garden and it's all rocks. Well, you hear that all the time. It's a constant thing you hear because, well, you're in the Yucatan Peninsula and the Yucatan Peninsula has rocks. But guess what? That's the most productive of all. If it's rock, that means it's productive. It means all the minerals are necessary. How do we get the minerals released out of those rocks could be the challenge. And in the tropics, unfortunately, most of the literature for the last 60 or so years has all been developed in the Western world. So we go and we go online, we ask Mr. Google how to do this, how to do that. We go to the libraries and we ask the, the publisher how to do this and how to do that. And we all go, oh, let's compost. That's the best way. Well, composting is, is an absolute failure in a tropical environment. It's an absolute failure. We don't have cold climates. We don't have the diseases that, that cold climates have. The reason you compost is to manage bio, biomass. In the tropics, if you compost, you're wasting time, you're wasting energy. You have to measure how much calories does it take to do an activity and how much calories do you get out of that activity in the form of whatever, bananas or plantains or tomatoes or sweet peppers or cassava or ginger. How much energy went into that to how much energy you're going to get out? Now, to increase soil fertility in the tropics, there's no magic, there's no secret, there's no talent. It's hard work, and that's it. Biomass, you need to take a lot of organic matter into your farms, of all kinds, as much as possible. Don't look for a formula, because a formula is not necessary. When you have reached anywhere, anywhere between 40 to 50 tons of what you're producing per acre, then you can start fine-tuning the music. But before that, think big. A ton, you're taking too small. Per acre, we need to start with anything from 40 to 60 tons of organic matter per acre. All right? So when we're thinking about gardening, let, let us, everybody asks me, oh, how much organic matter should I put? How much compost should I put? How much do you have? A truckload? A lorry load? It doesn't matter. Whatever you have. Just use it. It's important in the tropics to use a lot of organic matter. Don't worry about, oh, it's going to burn the roots. No, it's not going to burn the roots. The tropics takes care of that. Initially, and there's science behind this. I won't get into the science today. If there's science minds in here, they'll argue with me about, oh, it will take out the nitrogen. And all of that is true. All of that, the science part of all of that is absolutely true. But it auto-corrects itself with time. You just have to start adding the material, adding the material, and then choosing the right crops. Now, who would like to have sweet potato every day? Maybe nobody. Or cassava every day. Or pumpkins every day. Or plantains every day. And all of these are mostly starch commodities. Or, or that whole group of what we call yams. But these are the crops that do well in these conditions, have high yields, can store well. We don't need agrochemicals because they are very, very, very aggressive against agrochemicals or against insect pets. So there's an important thing in the tropics. It's impossible to fight insects. 
It's impossible to fight funguses. It's impossible to fight viruses or bacteria. It's just impossible. You're airborne. There's nothing you can do. You're in the air. There's just nothing you can do. So if you, if you start to think about, oh, maybe if I have a, 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 a row of marigolds, and then all lemongrass and barriers and all those things, those are, to be honest, those are semantics. And that is once your field is, is already up and productive. The first and foremost thing is become good soil farmers. That is the most important thing. If you achieve soil fertility, then you achieve productivity. And to achieve soil for productivity, you just have to add organic matter and keep adding organic matter. I cannot stress how important it is to add <coughs> organic matter. It's critical. And not a little bit. It's a large quantities. Can you describe or define what organic matter would be? Organic matter is anything that has carbon. In other words, anything that came from the planet. What? Skins. Anything that has life. Skins, grass cuttings, branches, uh, I don't know, all the ways from your kitchen. Uh, if, you're not, if you're not into the, a, 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 a very strict vegan concept, blood from, from slaughter plants, uh, bone meal, tripe, everything, everything is organic matter. Everything, all of those things have carbon, and all of those things have a tremendous con contribution. Now, once your soil fertility is up, then we can start to look at the sources of your organic matter. But to begin with, all of us, without exception, have low soil fertility, no matter where you go in the country. The country is only divided into two sections when it comes to soils. We have the Belize River Valley, which starts, technically it starts somewhere around where Central Farm is, the, the, the actual farm, not on the high, but that region, that is known as Baking Pot, and it goes all the way to what the communities we know as uh, Spanish Lookout and so forth, and it goes all the way down into where, around where Borel Boom is. That is the Belize River Valley. The Belize River Valley by far is the most fertile soil Belize has, by far. There is no soil in this country that is as fertile. Those are very old floodplains, those are what we call alluvial soils. They are rich in clays also, but most of them are alluvial soils. And they're very deep, rich soils. Those are the most productive soils we have. Uh, sorry, fertile soils. Now, Belize's most productive soils are in the Stancrit Valley, by far. That's why the major industry Belize has is in the Stancrit industry, because they're most productive. The Belize River Valley is the most fertile. Fertility has nothing to do with productivity. You could have an extremely fertile soil that is unproductive because it cannot release the nutrients the way a plant eats, the way a plant feeds, the, the plants can't get the nutrients out of the soil to convert it into food for us. So the Stan Creek River Valley has the most productive soils because the very deep profiles, they're very rich in, in, in minerals and they, they can release the minerals with a slight, slight addition of something like dolomite. They become productive. In the case of the Belize River Valley, with a slight modification of drainage, they also become productive. But drainage is important. Now, productivity and soil and, and, and fertility have to come hand in hand eventually for you to have a high yield. So you can have a fertile soil that's unproductive, and you can have a, a, a productive soil that is not fertile and it eventually the system will collapse. Now why do we, we talk about this? Because we're talking about, at the end of the day, we want to have a, a commodity on the market or in your kitchens that was produced without agrochemicals. And there's no magic to it. It's just hard work. There's, there's absolutely no magic to it. What do we need to do? There's a, term, there's a terminology known as a threshold, the economic threshold. That's only a terminology, it's a fancy word. It means nothing other than. If a plant, if the insect is attacking a plant and the plant is losing, say, a tenth of the leaf a day, we need that plant to be able to produce five times the amount of leaf that the insect is eating or the pest. And we'll call pests anything from weeds to bacteria to viruses to insects, whatever. It's whatever is affecting our crop. 
So we need our crops to be able to outperform whatever is attacking it. And there are some crops that naturally do that. And those are the crops that we, we, we call underutilized crops, crops that we're not utilizing because they're not trendy. For example, everybody knows breadfruit. Breadfruit will outproduce the capacity of insects to damage the leaves. The, what is known as the economic threshold of breadfruit is about 1 to 10. In other words, for every one tenth of, of, of loss in the Bio that in the, the, the biomass the plant has in, in leaf and branches it's producing 10 times more from what the insect has eaten. Sweet potato is another fascinating plant like that. Sweet potato is probably the most miraculous plant that you can find in the tropics. Sweet potato produces food not only below ground but above ground. It is not our culture in, within Central America and most, most of the Western culture also does not consume sweet potato cuttings, the, the tips and the leaves. Yet, most of Asia, when they say we're having sweet potato, they're not talking about what was underground. They're talking about the leaf. Most of Africa, most of the Caribbean also. In the Caribbean, the only Belize calls the amaranth kalalu. In the Caribbean, kalalu is either sweet potato tips, or what we call makal, or cocoa yams in English. That is what they refer to as kalalo. Nobody in Central America consumes the, the cocoa yam stalks. Just before the, the, the flag, it's called the flag leaf, the leaf opens up, it's a, it comes out very beautifully and curved. Just before that opens up, that is harvestable, chopped up and eaten. None of us consume that. We all wait for the underneath to be ready to harvest, which takes a long time. Now. If we learn to adapt our cuisine, our practices, from a simple humble plant like sweet potato, which produces underground and above ground, then we have a tremendous biomass. And those are crops that naturally have developed over thousands of years to defend themselves from insects, from diseases, by growing faster in, in very poor soils. In very poor soils. It is a common belief that the soil has to be plowed or very very nice and beautiful without rocks for sweet potato and that is as far as the, from the truth as can be now it is absolutely true, truthful that the soil must be well plowed and free of all rocks if you want a beautifully formed sweet potato <laughs> but not if you want a sweet potato sweet potato re re responds to pressure the more pressure in the soil, the harder the soil, the bigger it gets. But it doesn't get big and pretty. It has a funny shape. And that's the reason why we plow the land. It's the only reason why we plow the land. Because we want a beautiful looking sweet potato. But not because if we, are, if we change our mindset and are willing to take the time take the, and wash the sweet potato, Regardless if it's long or, or crooked or has a funny shape, it looks like a hand, it's still a sweet potato. The nutritional value hasn't changed at all. As a matter of fact, that's the one you probably should be buying because you can pretty much guarantee that's the one without nematicides. That's why it has some damage. All right? Now, sorry? And it's also beautiful. It's also beautiful. If you're an artist, then it's beautiful. So, there are, there are many crops in the tropics, and we can, we can easily elaborate a list of the crops that do well in the tropics with, with very poor fertility, and those that do very well with very high fertility. I'll give you a very good example. Anybody, those young men back there who are from the villages of Cristoria and San Antonio, who have farmed since little boys, if you ask them to fertilize cocoa yams or pumpkins, and you see what will happen. There'll be no fruit at all. If you fertilize cocoa, or some people refer to it as dashin, they will not bear fruit. They go into biomass, they get massive trees, beautiful trunks. But that's not what we eat. We eat the roots underneath. So not all crops re re respond to high fertility. Some crops require low fertility. They need stress. 
so that they do produce food because the food that pr a plant is producing is not for us to eat it's arrogant to think that a plant is producing for us to eat it's producing to guarantee the survival of its kind and some crops require high fertility and others require low fertility they all require fertility and productive soils but not all nutrients that we talk about apply to all crops and sometimes we make that mistake so if we're going to be successful and grow a group like this we also have to grow our appetite and change our taste buds and become way more creative I know Miss Mary um, has started or has finished a cookbook and, and that is something that is tremendously lacking throughout the world and we are part of this world and Belize is no different in how do we prepare our raw material if I give you a plantain why, why are we only frying plantains or baking them? Why we don't have plantain flour readily available in the store? There's no reason why we, we, we cannot have that. And plantains are tremendously productive. The biodiversity, the, genet the natural genetic diversity of plantains is so much that it's next to impossible for them to be destroyed. I, yes? Coconuts and plantains have the same potential and they're not being overutilized. That's correct. They're all tree crops within a country like Belize are underutilized. All of them. And a farm that is void or lacking tree crops is not a sustainable farm. Because for a farm to be sustainable, those roots have to go as deep as possible to get all the nutrients that are not on the surface, bring them up to the leaves, the leaves convert them into re readily available nutrients, when the leaves fall and decompose, they, those nutrients become available. But those nutrients, we cannot make them. I don't care how much the scientific community has looked at the science behind crops. We are still missing nutrients. If you go to any periodic chart, which is the, 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 in chemistry, everybody, there's a little chart where they tell you where it's hydrogen and nitrogen and blah, 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 and, and all the periodic chart. There's still elements that we have not discovered. We only think we have discovered them. But there are elements that are still missing. And if you don't believe me, any animal that is on a so-called balanced diet underperforms an animal that's outside in a diet that appears not to be balanced. That means there's some nutrients, elements missing somewhere. That is why animals in free range perform better than animals in captivity. Although the ones in captivity might have better so-called nutrition. We call them balanced diets. But is it truly balanced? The answer is no. Because the animal, you can see it in the animal. The animal does not grow as we would like it to grow. The soil is the same and plants are the same. So it's important that we have deep-rooted plants in the form of trees in our farms. It is critical. And trees will outproduce any type of crop you have. It doesn't matter what kind of crop you have. A tree is more productive because the nature of that tree, the way it absorbs nutrients and it transforms it into fruit is just way more than what uh, other plants that have smaller roots can do. So it's very important. Now, how do we take those plants and make them into the everyday availability? And how do we put a monetary value on that? And that's something also I think, unfortunately, for groups like Pro Organic to be successful, we have to look at again carefully is the monetary value of things. For example, Dottie and Karen and Bart and Mary come in here all the time, and Martin and certain vegetables for free. There has to be a monetary value to that, unfortunately, for things to succeed. If not, one day they will, the sun will rise without them. Not tomorrow, but one day it will, and that's where it dies. And projects like this don't continue because there's not a monetary value. I don't like capitalism, I'm a socialist, with no apologies to anybody, especially the French. They don't like socialists, they kill all of us. <laughs> some, move, some move to believe. Some move to believe. Anyway, it's a bad joke. Um, what I'm saying is that we have to put a monetary value. It cannot just be a romantic idea. It, it has to be a monetary value. Somebody now, uh, and this is just, again, my opinion, and I don't want to offend anybody who, who founded Pro-Organic and, and is very active in Pro-Organic. 
somebody from Pro Organic has to now take Pro Organic and grow it into a feasible enterprise and then continue the educational program of promoting healthy eating. But if we leave it at those regular consumers, it will die. It will just die another regular death like all other NGOs and do-gooders of this world. Because it has to grow and there's no young people in these activities. I think this young man is the youngest. Everybody else? He's definitely a baby. Oh, um, Clayton? <laughs> He's a baby amongst the rest of them. <laughs> but we are, we're not growing. We're not, we're not promoting amongst the young population. And the young population cares less what they eat. And that's the target. That's the target group, and we're not targeting. We're all worried because, oh, <laughs> we might die of cancer tomorrow because we're old now. Well, I'm not, but anyway. <laughs> We have to focus on growing the young people in the communities. I have no answers for that. I don't know how to do that. It's one of the most difficult things. To get, to stop somebody from eating something like ramen soup and start to eat something like, I don't know, a good healthy soup made out of cassava or something. It's next to impossible because the taste, the taste buds of these, the, the way the chemistry behind products like ramen is so effective. <coughs> They've studied it so well that the substances in there are so addictive that you taste it once and you forever want it. It's like a Coca-Cola. It's just magic what we have done. To the design, for example, Coca-Cola, the plastic bottles, not the glass bottles. If you do a hundred people and ask them what tastes nicer, a, pla a plastic bottle or a glass bottle? And they'll all tell you the glass bottle. But it's the same amount, I mean the same I could have made the same uh, mother mixture and put it in separate containers. And you know what it is? It's not the plastic. It is the design of the rim around the glass bottle. For when you tip it, it falls right exactly where those taste buds are that will react to the carbonation of that liquid. It's not because it's glass. If you shape that plastic the same shape, it will have the same effect. That is why a teacup is not an ordinary cup. People think this. A teacup, the rim on a teacup is made for drinking tea. And it's not just any ordinary cup. It's a hundred <coughs> years of research to develop what we call a china, which is a proper teacup for drinking tea. You just don't get a cup and drink tea. We do, but that's not a cup of tea. A cup of tea has science behind it. And food is the same. How do we formulate what percentage of, of sweet potato can go with amaranth and what percentage of amaranth can now go with, with uh, say, plantains and cassavas and all of that? How do we do that? And we need to get people in groups like these who are now willing to go the next step and organize and design meals for us. Because we can't do it. We don't have the capacity because it needs creativity. And not everybody's creative. We would like to believe that we are creative, but not everybody is creative. We are good for something, but it's not creativity. I'm not that creative. I'm the first one to acknowledge that. I'll follow behind. <laughs> now, there's, there's many, many tropical crops that we're not utilizing. The variety of beans that are in the tropics are way underutilized. You go to the market and there may be well, two or three varieties. Everybody talks about red kidney beans and black beans. But within the black beans, there's four, over 400 types of black beans that have different flavors. Some can be made into drinks, some can be made into, into uh, energy drinks, and all of, because they all have different qualities, different flavors to add to the, to the variety so it's not boring. Be because food gets boring after a while. That's why pre-packaged food is so nice, because it's all the additives to stimulate your brain to say, oh, this is good. Although it's rubbish, ooh, it's good. Okay? So now, my challenge here is how do we grow these groups? Is it by all of us bringing three or four people more? I don't know. I don't know. But what is the objective and how to grow these groups is the challenge 
for poor organic and it's a very big challenge because I don't see any growth. I see the, co the, the same people going on and on and on with it. But what's the next step? Why is it that the entire market is not like that? Why is it that we are so addicted to agrochemicals? Because agrochemicals are a tremendous addiction. It's, it's so addictive that once you've tried it, it's very difficult to not use them again because the reaction is very quick. If a plant is, is deficient in something, we, we can add something. If there's an insect there, we can just apply something. If there's too many weeds, we can apply the herbicide. That's why heroin is so successful. Heroin? Maybe we should be started. Same, killing, same kind of thing. It's killing the soil when you're killing the fungus or the insect or the bug instead of having the natural ways of going back. The book that just came out. <coughs> this is anybody who can understand this book. It's called Teaming with Microbes, the Organic Gardener's Site, the Soil Food Book. It's a very, very good book. And it, it breaks down for anyone like from that could understand how when you use chemicals, it actually is being kind of productive. You're losing some of the productivity. We are. There's just um, well, I've been, I've been observing pro-organic uh, quite a bit, and what I see is there are three demographics of people. Obviously, people who grow food organically, which are the people who are selling the crops to the organization. And then you have the consumers group, just the group of people that are only purchasing the produce. And then you have like the enthusiast group, or maybe the organizer group, whatever you want to call it. But I don't see much of a dynamic interaction between those three groups. Um, it's more transactional. Like for example, um, you know, you, somebody in the consumers group side of things, they really, they really won't care as much about native crops. So they're thinking, oh great, I can find organic tomatoes. You know, um, that's the way they're looking at it. Um, so, but they're the ones paying for it. They're the ones technically keeping the organization at least running to the point where it, it, it's functional it's functional you know um, so is the question does it need to expand the consumers group side of things in most cases the the uh, board of directors and within pro organic don't and can't have the capacity to expand beyond distributing in just this area would mean the only potential growth would be within Cayo district or opening up additional chapters but again like it seems like um, yeah we are just kind of looking at where we, we come to this presentation we're hopeful we want to see pro organic keep going but the way <coughs> that it's been diagnosed is it's you know it's going to die that so, is my opinion unless we do something together about it I think you know the best one to ask why I'm not more conclusions part of this group, how can we reach them? You are Belizean. Why, why tell us why are not more uh, Belizeans involved in this? My answer is very simple, and I might be wrong. But my observation is they don't have the time. They, they're, they're, they're struggling from paycheck to paycheck, from day to day. They're struggling. It's an absolute luxury to think organic. They're thinking where uh, my next spoonful for my children are coming from. And I think that's what the bottom line is. They, we have been, we have been convinced that the Western model of development is what development is. It is still in legislation that development of land means land clearing. If I go to, 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 to the government, or to a lending institution. I have a piece of land now, I want to, I want to farm it. You know what development means to them? Yeah. Clear cutting Clear. and putting a, a row crop, a commercial crop. That's what it means, that's what development is. It doesn't mean harnessing what's already there, utilizing what's there, and making it function as a, as a, as a model. It doesn't mean that. You will not get a dime from an NGO or a lending institution a development bank or a commercial bank 
to say, okay, I'm going to have a permaculture system. They're going to laugh at you. Say, hey, guess what, buddy? Go, go somewhere else. We have no time for you. Because the bottom line doesn't show profit. Now, you ask me why are no more Belizeans involved? Because I firmly believe that they're not concerned about their food. They're not, they're, they don't care about their health yet. They, they do, but they do not. They're, they're so busy getting their children ready for school, getting the next dollar for buying the next chicken. It, mm -hmm. It's what we refer to as a rat race. That has, what is essentially what it is. So I can sit back on my farm in luxury, although I'm not wealthy, I'm not worried if I'm going to eat tonight. I can guarantee you Shelly is cooking for me tonight. And she's going to cook whatever I put there. Ask Clayton. Clayton needs to live there. So I'm not going to go hungry. But I do have workers that are thinking, <laughs> maybe the boss is not paying me enough. And I think it's a fundamental problem in society. But that's a much bigger problem to address than, than what Pro Organic can address. But I do think true members like Pro Organic, like, like yourself, like myself, we can participate on a one-to-one -one with a family and, and, and try to create a, an environment. And I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime or in your lifetime. I, I firmly think it's a generational change. It will take a, it will take a while. It's not an easy step. It's a, it's, a, it's a step of faith. Historically, for years, if you're indigenous, you're no good. You're a third-rate citizen. If you are eating indigenous crops, when I was a kid, which was too long ago, I'm only 43. If you ate tortillas, black beans, and sardines, you'd never say that. That's only poor people. You had fried chicken and a coke. <laughs> and that's reality. It still is, right? And we have to face these realities of life. It's all fine and dandy to say, oh, this is what it is. But the reality in our society is entirely different. You go to their homes, and a, and, and, and a luxury is a Coca-Cola and a fried chicken from the Chinese. Deep fried, ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the reality. Now, I might be wrong. I might be completely wrong, but that is our reality. If you go to any store, I challenge anybody to go to any store anywhere in the country, they're all a photocopy of the next. There's only three importers in this country. And they have divided the different commodities so this shelf here is all, I can tell you, at, at, there's this shelf which is Grace Kennedy, which were all Grace Kennedy products, and the bottom shelf is all back products, and the, the other shelf is all noodles. You go to the other side, it's, it's all canned beans of all different types. But it's the same. All, all shops are the same. And we all flock to them. And we all buy these commodities. None of us go to the teller and says, guess what? Is there... Is there something else? Because we don't want this. And if we all did that, probably the teller would ask the distributor to get something else. I challenge anybody to go to any shop in Belize and find 10 Belizean products. 10. I guarantee you, you might find two. You can't find 10 Belizean products. You have Marie Sharp, which produces a number of products, and that is one product. She produces some jams, some jellies, some marmalade uh, and some hot sauces. That's one entity. You have CPBL, which produces some orange juice, some coconut juice, which are theirs. The other products they have are not theirs. They're, they're reconstituted there, like the apple juices and so forth. That's a reconstitution. All right? We don't grow apples. BSI produces sugar for us, and that's it. That's it. Not even the beans in the stores are now national beans. The rice is, so that's a third problem. The beans now are mostly by Goya. Don't believe me, just go to the stores. Mostly by Goya, that's coming from Spain. Go Spain elaborate, uh, um, puts it together somewhere in the world, but it's, it's, it's a Spanish product, Goya. New Jersey. New Jersey. New Jersey. Um, distributed in the US. Anyway. Distributed, yeah. yeah. Um, Del Monte products. I mean, a pineapple on the market right now, I think is 250 for a pineapple, 350 for a pineapple. And yet we will go to the store and buy a little can of pineapple for I think $4. Mm -hmm. And we will do that. A Belizean family will do that and then add condensed milk that came from somewhere else again. 
that's what we will do that's our culture so you're asking you're asking us to transform a culture which we have to do because we're dying also but how do we do it I don't have those answers Authority. Sorry? Authority. Authority. Yes. You have to tell like to a child, don't do this, do that. But you know even parents have given up that authority, they want to be friends to their children. So they always let them do the bad things. So that's what is happening. Because you know like about the beans, the young man who was working for me was always telling me this Patricia. We have a lot of dreams, but we are selling it to Guatemala. We don't know what to do with it, you know, because they are not uh, informed that they can do something in Belize with the beans that they are, they are cultivating. Some some beans go to Guatemala. The, the bean, most beans that are produced in the way in the south of Belize, some of that is going to Guatemala. But Guatemala will not buy red kidney beans. It's not when I say they won't buy, they won't buy quantities of it because it's not their culture. Guatemala eats mostly black beans. It's a different flavor. It goes well with corn tortillas and cheese and cream and that type of thing. So, so it, it's a very, very unique. Beans are very, very cultural, very cultural. I'll give you an example. In, in 2000, I was, I was hired on a, on a short project because uh, there's an entity in Belize called CARI, and it works throughout uh, the Caribbean. And Belize is a member of what is known as the CARICOM. And there's a group of farmers, very, very good farmers, that produce very good beans. And they wanted to sell their beans into the CARICOM. CARICOM said yes, and it was actually um, Guyana who was going to buy these beans. And they said they buy red kidney beans. And they needed five containers. A container then was 44,000 pounds, I still remember. It was all packed nicely, ready to go. When it reached to Guyana, it was rejected. The wrong color. Sure. And, and red kidney beans matures. If you harvest them today, they're pink, and they get the, the color of red changes. So, beans are cultural, like anything else, but how do we break these cultures? Why is it that we're just thinking about beans as stew beans or fry beans? Why are we not having a bean, why is there no bean drinks? Why are there no bean uh, uh, paste? Why are there no beans? Are? So this is what I'm talking about, the creativity, the, the new the ingenuity to, to create new products that are readily available. Because guess what? I challenge anybody here to think that people are going to go back to cooking beans. It's not going to happen. Unless, we, <laughs> but you are different. <laughs> if, you are, if anybody who is already here in this group today, Listening to me talk, you're already different. You're eccentric. And that's the bottom line. That's the absolute truth. Who is not here is going to the store to buy, not only to buy imported beans, but pre-cooked, pre-fried beans. You're going to no. wait, not even with a lid. It's an easy open. We're going to open it. Now we're gonna speak. Now that is, that no, is, <laughs> sorry? Not Belizeans. They grow their own. No. We are importing, last year we imported $42 million worth of beans. Don't believe me, go to the Gazette. Go to any store in Belize right now, any store. And there's 12 types of beans that are pre-cooked and ready to go on the shelf. Yes or no, Clayton? Clayton checked that out when he was here last time. I ate a lot of them, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's cooking beans anymore. That's something of the past. And that is a reality. They are in seven months. Let us, let us, let us, let us not romanticize things and let us hold the bull by the horn. Seven Miles is a community in this country, like in the fourth place of the most agrochemicals utilized. All right. So no, they're not growing no beans and they're not consuming no beans in Seven Miles. We need to now address these things without political correctness. Seven Miles is riddled with agrochemicals. I know, but they are growing beans. They really are. I'm growing beans. Everybody in my area, San Antonio, grows their own beans. Yeah. So where is it? So why is it? Why is it not on the market? It all stays in home. It stays there. It all stays. I they grow it their own. My family eats it, and that's as far as it's. Yeah. You need, you need, you need 
for a community, where, which community are you in? San Antonio. San Antonio. How many people are in San Antonio? Not roughly. Many. Roughly. That's, that's, that's what we're talking about. 1,000. So for 1,000 people that lived in San Antonio, how much, how much beans do we cook for a meal? It's about a pound for a regular family. More or less. Depends on the, the a regular family. Poverty level of the... no, a regular family cooks about a pound of beans. You boys at the back there, how much beans? No, I'm getting to a point. Everything is numbers, my friend. How much beans a family eats on a daily basis? More than a pound or less than a pound? A pound and a half. A pound and a half. So we're just two and I cook a pound every other day or a pound and a half. Okay. So let us say that a regular family in San Antonio, say there's a thousand people, let's say there's uh, 300 families. Would, would that be a good, good guess? 800 pounds of beans. So we have 800 pounds of beans a day being consumed in San Antonio. Right? An acre of beans yields between 1,500 to 1,800 pounds. So in a year, how many acres does San Antonio have planted? It doesn't add up, my friend. It just doesn't add up. Yeah, but it, yes, it, it, in other words, they would be eating yeah. half an acre a day. You would need, for 300 days, is how much? 150 acres. Nowhere in San Antonio, the whole of San Antonio, in everything that they're cultivating, doesn't have 150 acres cultivated including peanuts, including everything. Everybody in San Antonio, nobody has more than 10 acres cultivated. Sorry? There's some pretty big farms out. Yeah, and there is some, you know, I know people that have 200 acre farms. Not in crops. <laughs> not in crops. <laughs> they're, 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 not, they're not growing, you know, sustainably or anything, but they are killing it up. San Antonio doesn't have any farmer that will have 200 acres of anything. No. 200 acres of anything would feed 360,000 people in this country. Mm -hmm. And they just end up going to the market. It's 22,000 pineapples per acre. It is 50,000 cabbages per acre. It is 120,000 tomato plants per acre. No, nobody has 10 acres or 200 acres of anything. They don't want to use that. I'm just saying. Well, no, they do because it's easy for them. They just go with a spray pattern. Numbers are an interesting thing in farming. You, you, you could say anything, but it's like BTB telling me that they had a million guests last year stay here. And we didn't, we didn't, we didn't quadruple the importation. No. A million guests did not eat here last year. They didn't. You, you, you could say, the, the, the data could show anything. What is reality? You have, to, you have to understand reality. Numbers have to match up. There's a lot of numbers people in here. Numbers have to match up. If they don't, I get into trouble with my staff, and they get into trouble with me. Oh, yeah, I agree with what you said, but the statement that was kind of maybe it was a blanket statement, you know, that, that lesions just aren't, they're not growing their own beans, they're not, eating, no, they're not eating beans, it all comes from a can. And a lot of us live in, in larger communities, yeah, everybody goes to Chinese, it's easy. But in some of the smaller villages, a lot of people, even though, I don't know anybody that buys beans in a can, personally, not one person. Well, let me correct myself. Let me correct myself. The majority of the beans we're consuming are imported. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the majority of the beans we're producing, we're exporting. Yeah, that's, that's true of almost <laughs> anything everywhere. <laughs> so, and I, I don't understand the reasons for it, but that is what's happening. Sugar is the same. We produce a tremendous amount of sugar, and it's all exported. Or the majority, I, I will rephrase again, the majority is exported. The remnants stay, that stay in Belize stays here, but the majority is, is exported. And then we re-import it. We, we import a lot of sugar, yes. So the question started, how are we going to convince Belizeans? That's right. And, and I gave up on that a long time ago. So but you are a Belizean, Bart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, we, you know, we do still have to look at where could we go. And, yes. and one of the things we do need to have is a market for those who do wish to grow um, organically or pesticide free. And what we have found is, is that there is a fair amount of foreigners who are have already become convinced. Yes. And they are demanding from their restaurants something a little bit safer. And we approached Co Organic Approach, the Hotel Association, the BTIA. Um, with this concept that if they would go to their restaurants, look at the marketing value of, of 
it's being able to say this was produced organic, <coughs> or pesticide free, then those restaurants and those hotels or resorts or whatever will get some value from the marketing end of it, even if the price is a little higher. And it will be a little higher, but it doesn't have to be a lot. Well, that'll be another discussion, just because of crop failures, maybe. But um, that is a, a strategy to prime the pump. Yes. I have found that, that people here are quick to learn once they see a lot of people doing something. Um, we have created a proof of concept in the last three years that we can produce these boxes of food with the addition of volunteer help, which has a value, but that very close to market value. Yes. Okay. And that, it was surprising to many people. Sometimes our boxes are the same. And even if you put a little bit of value in, in the people who are volunteering, it, 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 we've, we have achieved that. And, um, you know, some, many people know here that a group of us have been doing most of the work. Um, I've had to resign about three weeks ago, and so that's one reason why we're having this discussion. You know, is this uh, group going to just uh, say it was a good fight, or uh, are we going to uh, find a farmer? Because a lot of it, this is designed to be a CSA, but it never has been. It's always been a hybrid. You know, a little bit volunteer, a little bit of, of uh, two or three different factors. But a, a CSA often is run not as a volunteer thing, but rather as a uh, farm, farmer driven thing. And I, like you, I believe that, uh, at least I understand you, that free enterprise or this should be a commercial thing. You know, we've got it to a certain point, we have a, 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 a list of people who are ready, we, we could transfer that list over to somebody else or a group of farmers and they could take it over and it would be run differently. It would be run as an as a economic enterprise. And I think that that's the only way it can do it. I totally agree. Some, some, some of us are getting older or busier or have, you know, distracted. Or both. Or distracted with grandkids. So I'm just saying that I hope myself that we have carried the torch far enough that somebody will take it over. It might be uh, some of the farmers in this room, including yourself. The gentleman at the question. Now, um, I'm a, a little appalled, maybe even uh, <laughs> offended by the amount of pessimism uh, which uh, this uh, our initiative is taking uh, in in going anywhere. And uh, what we have to do will be cause the people in here, we know, and you know, we have to deal with the education of the people in Belize and deal, and to counteract the miseducation that 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 uh, that, that uh, blankets of the country. And so, if you can get start educating people, if you've got a room full of people here, and you can get at least three people, uh, you know, converted. And that starts to grow, and it, it, it doesn't start from nothing and stay nothing if you're working on it. So we have to take that initiative and start educating people in the direction that we need them to go. We we know uh, us old biddies in here, you know, that are far off or whatever, or however that uh, suggestion goes. But you know, yeah, let, let's go into schools, etc start teaching the truth about uh, the food and, and the health and what's the attack on your health that, that is imminent. Well, I apologize if I offended you with my pessimism. I can guarantee you I'm an optimist. I'm just presenting you the facts. I don't think it's a lost battle because I know a lot of people like you in this room who, who want clean products, all right? Now, I think that there's a step that we need to do quickly, um, and it will take somebody with an with entrepreneur mind, and we need to open a stall at the market. We need to get a permanent um, marketplace, not a little tent, but a, one of the permanent stalls, where initially 
just to give you a little bit of the background um, history, and I came in afterwards. The, the, the founders are still here. Um, Poor Organic was going to go full organic and was going to follow a system called the iPhone system, which has less paperwork than being organic. But my recommendation is, if we can achieve, if we, we can get somebody to run a full-time store at the market, we would then need Poor Organic's job would then be at random to get some products from there and send them for testing. And that will keep the checks and balances on the farmers. So it's run based on a trust, trust relationship rather than on paperwork. Because we also have to be ethical and moral about what we're doing. The, the, the ethics behind Pro Organic have to be maintained. But for us to open up to the community, we have to be in the community's face. We have to have a, a proper market stall with all sorts of products. Not only veggies, honey, and I don't know, whatever. Everything that's out there. But we have to have a system of testing. And it has to be paid for by the consumers to guarantee your, the, the quality that, you're saying, that we're saying you're getting. Because it's very easy, it's very easy to hide chemicals. Very, very easy to hide if we're not testing. So at random, we would have to pull a product, say a tomato, a, a radish, whatever it is, and send them to be tested. At the moment it comes, in a second, in, in, in a moment it comes back uh, positive for, for a prohibited, we just stop buying from that farmer. That's it, whatever, no excuses. So that, so that we are kept honest along the way, and it has to be done. If you're gonna do honey, you have a hive of bees right here. They cover 12,000 acres. They do. So yeah. you can't say that your honey is organic. But certified. we can test. Yeah. Well, you can test, but we <coughs> can test. It's not All good. products, regardless of what we're doing, we'd have to test them. I'm just warning you. That's right. right. I, I agree with you 100%. But if you refuse the hope of somebody, then uh, how are they going to eat? I didn't understand. If I refuse... The crop of someone... Somebody's crop. Yes, but my neighbor is using so much chemicals, you know. Yes. And he's farming everywhere, and everybody trusts him. So if, I, if we were to do something to him, for instance, a lot of people would have to stop their farming for a certain length of time until the soil and everything is cleared of all the chemicals. And how, how do they eat? How do they function? Very, very easily. You, we don't have to, we, we do not have to completely um, stop farming around it. Agrochemicals do, 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 do um, maintain in the soil for a long period of time. But it is not necessarily true that they do travel very far out. And we can, we do have crops that can take chemicals out of the ground. And if I started, it's, it's very simple. So today I tested, and let's say it had, what, what's the talk of the town? Glyphosate is the talk of the town, Roundup. Say it had 15 parts per thousand of glyphosate, okay? Next month when I test, so say we accepted that product, because everywhere has glyphosate. Next month when I test, it should have, say, 12 parts. The following month it should have 11 parts and so forth. That is telling me that they have ceased using the chemicals, there are still residues, but we're in what is known as transition. And that is what iPhone allows. It allows a transition. So it's, nothing is cold turkey. Yes, we have now agreed we're going to do this the right way. I do have residue, but now we're going to have a transition. And, and maybe, maybe, I think it's up to five years. I think there's a five year period in which then you're absolutely considered to be clean. Not organic, because organic is too much paperwork. Yeah. Sorry, he had a question right now. Is there anything in Belize that's formally set up to do testing internally within Belize or any kind of standard testing, or does that have to be sent away to test, or how does that work? The answer is yes, they do have, so we have already researched it. They do have a nice lab. And what's the economics behind that? They're actually not that expensive. They, but there is a problem right now, I, be, I believe. The reagents that they have are old because they were not utilized. No, they're in Taiwan. They're in Taiwan? They, they, those reagents are from Taiwan. 
and they're too expensive to bring to here. Okay. But underlying that, we're not allowed to test here because of WTO. I mean, we're not allowed to test anything coming in until we can test here. So there are, so Pro Organic and a few other organizations are now trying to come up with a petition to the Bureau of Standards to develop the standards for the testing. They don't have any standards yet. There is a lab in Guatemala that we've already contacted. We contacted last year, and I just checked in my book. It was last year, February, a year ago, soon. And, it, and the testing is relatively cheap for 200 grams, which is quite a bit of product when it comes to, to for a test. It is 60 US dollars to do a profile of the, of the product. In other words, they will test everything on that product, including the nutritional value of that product. That's okay. and now my question, Dottie, to you is, if the standards say that we're not allowed to test anything coming in until we test everything inside of Belize, is that government standards for anything that would be shipped out of Belize? Or if I decide to spend oh, my no, own no, money... Oh, no, no, the stuff that you ship oh. out, you have, it, the standards are determined by your market. Right, right. Whoever right. buys from you tells you what you have to do. But what I'm saying is, if I decide to spend my own money to have my own product tested, is can anybody say anything? No. And no. can I say my product's tested and I have three grades of product or I have one grade of product and it falls within these parameters and yeah, use that as marketing that. material? Okay. You can say, you can yeah, that. you can say that. Exactly what I'm... It's very practical. Now, we, we, we don't have to get overwhelmed with testing. Right. testing and that's why I think pro-organic decided <laughs> not to become organic and to follow the iPhone legislation because organic requires a lot, a lot of paperwork. And it's something very specific. Yes. I was just going to point out, I used to uh, work with the Illinois chapter, the Organic Crop Improvement Association, which, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the international certification agencies. And I know now, having bought a small parcel in San Antonio, that the, the, the stringent standards that the inspector has on an annual basis, he comes in the, initially and looks at your operation. And if he sees next door this field that's perfectly clean and finds out how come it's clean, and the one next on the other side the same way, he's not likely to even allow you the initial certification. But if he gives you the certification for good reason, okay, then he ha doesn't have to come back every year. Morally and ethically, he has a relationship with you, and he knows that John Doe, I was there, he showed me, and I'll recertify him the following year. I don't think the testing is necessarily necessary, but either way, there's a cost. But it's more about ethics and you know what, what can you do if you're the low-lying area and the guy above he's using all the chemicals right. but you, you got to set a standard you have, you to, have to adhere to that standard right I mean that's your product it's your standard if you're going to be organic I mean, why not just sell anything they do have they do have the, the group does come to Belize twice a year it's the Royal Society the Royal Soil Society and they do the testing and that is why our certificate for cacao was stripped from us because they did find traces when it should have been zero traces. Right. But our, the Cacao Association is still certified organically, the association, and they do get tested twice a year. There were some of their farmers that were found delinquent, so they, they have, they have, they're now in transition again, trying to come back. But the, the, the certifiers do come. Um, they used to, it used to be paid by a company called Green and Blacks, which were the, the, the cacao buyers, you know. Um, the banana growers also have, have their people come and inspect. They are not certifying organically, they are just certifying that whatever products were utilized, those are the products that are found the traceability. The testing is not difficult, to be honest. It's not difficult, nor is it, nor is it prohibited with costs. Now, there's also very, very small test kits you can buy, um, which are very, very cheap. And that probably is, a, is all like a group like pro-organic needs. We, we don't have to challenge, every, we don't have to fight every single battle. We just have to win the war. I think that <laughs> if, if you standardize that with pro-organic throughout the country, that would change the culture by force. Because yeah. you either got crap you can eat, or you've got this. And the price difference isn't really that much. We certify this, and then who's going to eat? Who's going who's gonna to drink Roundup? Here's a glass of Roundup. Go ahead. 
drink it. Unfortunately, my friend, people <laughs> will drink it. Of course they will. They will. But they will. eventually, there's going to get to a point where people aren't going to drink it. Why would you drink that if I had a, a perfectly clean glass of water? I, I don't know, but <laughs> but they do. Well, it sounds. Okay. I don't want to be. Guess, guess what? Not everybody lives forever, right? I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to sound funny here, but it does happen. I I'll give you an example. And, Yep, look, at, look, at, look at the display. Would, would shrink it either would. through attrition it would. or or whatever. But I mean, we have a display of, of products in all mm -hmm. in all of our stores, right? There is there's there's coconut water all the way from Malaysia right now, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And there's the big H product right there, which is I believe pretty wholesome. It's mm -hmm. very, I've been to the factory. I cannot swear by it, but I believe it's pretty wholesome. For that coconut water that's coming from Malaysia to be uh, to be stable in that can for I don't know I'm, I'm gonna guess two months something is in there coconut water goes rancid quickly okay it ferments very quickly because of the sugars and yet all those imported products outsell Big H Big H is struggling and has been for a long time now in uh, Belize City isn't there a testing equipment too Stephen? Baja and about two years ago there I saw Dr. Natalie Gibson Gibson yeah, yeah. There was some really expensive skin equipment, whatever happened. They didn't have any carrier gases, and the one technician was on maternity leave, so they had a long way to go. Really? The lab was just very running, so I don't know if it's been years. The, the, the shrimp farm called Blairatod has a first class lab, and they can test anything because they are ISO and HACCP cert certified for the EU. They, they send the shrimp into Belgium. So they are fully certified. They have everything in there. And they also will take outside products. As, as I said, it's not a prohibiting thing. It's just whatever the group decides. I, I, think, I think we now, as a group, need to move forward into the next step. And it, it is only my suggestion that it will be the gentleman and then you. That we, that we now have, we have to get into the people's faces with a stall, a full-time stall. But to have a full-time stall, we have to have full-time farmers that are credible farmers and we have to test them. That's one thing I, I, I will insist. There has to be some form of testing and either the consumer or the farmer or both of them have to pay for it. And I do think that that, that the community is, is ready. So there's 35,000 people between San Ignacio and Santa Elena. It's, it's a large community now. There must be 3,000 people that are willing to buy clean food. But The challenge is this. It is also my own opinion, and, I, and I'm very passionate about this. It cannot cost more. Not because it's organic and clean should it cost more. Because we want to target those people who cannot afford expensive food because it's clean. And that is important. And how do we, how do we create that? It has to be equally cost. And I don't... But I think the community is ready for it. I, I truly do. Yes, sir. Well, you know, we talk about people making choices, uh, dealing with the quality as opposed to that it does not have quality. More and more people are, are getting ill, they're reaching a crisis situation, and they're looking for uh, some answers uh, uh, and, and, you know, is getting a lot of people that asking her for her um, for what does she do to fix herself and, and lose uh, a lot of weight and all that kind of stuff. So uh, there are more people asking the, the important questions about what they're consuming and, uh, and taking uh, uh, making better choices about their food and or drink. And so, you know, continue to educate, uh, I think we'll get that. I believe so, but we have to be ready available. It has to be, it has to be, as, well, it doesn't have to be, it's my opinion that we should have a stall. I think that's good exposure. Yeah. Yes. I think we should have a stall, and I think that the only way to make maximum use of the stall is to use a lot of social media. There are enough people here to capable of doing that. 
um, we might not have enough young people to get to the youngest people, which we really need to do. But we need to get to young families and to lots of people. And social media now is a really big thing amongst the young people. So I think that's the way we need to go. So to me, we need two, two groups. And I don't know if we have enough people to actually do it, because we have to have workers. We have to have people who will keep the social media going constantly, constantly. Mm -hmm. Yes. I hit here, Jason okay. and then Barb. Uh, Justin, I was just uh, Justin. mentioning, um, I've, I've been hearing a lot about uh, this farmer's market that's in Bumblepan. Are you guys familiar with this? They, yes. I'm sure that they definitely would be interested in, in hosting a stall too. And then between, and that's Friday, so Friday and then Saturday is the market here in San Ignacio. It seems like if you had yourselves established as a location to start with those two, then you might have yourself a, a market already. Because there are, there are no other, um, you know, the problem is always distribution. Uh, there has to be a central point. And here with Pro Organic Belize right now, they have to collect it, they have to sort it and everything. But if you have a stall, then that, that can be good. So uh, depending on what the, the cost of having a stall, at the very least, you could have one for the weekends, so long as you had some sort of, a, again, volunteer or paid, you need to have some sort of structure that there's someone manning the booth. No volunteers. No, no volunteers. I, I, I think that the farmers have a great responsibility and we are falling behind, all farmers. We want to do too many things. They, they have cabbage, they have lettuce, they have tomato, they have everything. For the, the way I envision it, and I'm highly opinionated, you know, <laughs> is that we, we have specific farmers doing specific things and they take only high quality product to that stall. Forget this, this manpower we're using to sort. That comes to an end. And the CSA functions because we get our butts up and we go and we buy at that stall, that's our stall. If we want to promote it, maybe we can get little promotional cards, you know, <coughs> if you show your card, you're a member, you get, I don't know, five cents less on every commodity or something. I don't know, it's, how do we attract more and more people to come to our stall, the pro-organic stall or the CSA stall, if you could rename it, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, it's not about anybody's pride, it's about having a lot of good food on the market mm -hmm. and not being territorial, oh, well, this is my idea, that is that, you know, no, 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 it is about how do we have profitable farmers and a healthy community. To me, it's very simple and I think we need visibility in the market where we have specific farmers producing specific products and we have them ready available and then in addition to that we need to elaborate products jams and jellies and flour and all of people going to their herbal medicines it's, it's all there we have a stall that is you walk in and it's a wonder you want to be there you leave there broke yeah. is my time up Let's do it. Mr. Bad says that the, the mayor is open, it's worth talking to the mayor. I find the mayor to be very approachable. He knows I'm POP and we still get along, so I think he's very, he's very approachable. And um, I don't see why why a, a stall can't be a, a move forward. You, anybody else any questions? If not, thank you very much. I still uh, I wanted to finish about this thing. You know this farm though, you know, it needs to have on a paper exactly the, the circumstances he gets into if he decides to, to leave the chemicals, you know? What you describe, that for a certain time the soil will still carry some and all that. They need to know, otherwise they feel like they're punished and they hide and they do it anyway. But we do have to punish them. Yeah, but they know that at the same time there is a transition and they are getting into a safer, healthier way of growing the vegetable and the things. That's what they need to know because otherwise they don't do it. They need to you know can't punish the them without a way out. Yeah, and it has to be done very clearly. Yeah, just like you said it in few words to put it on paper. I would be very formal in what I do. I think you're wasting your time. 
Whichever farmer, whichever farmer chooses to use chemicals, just abandon them. Get the farmer who wants to do it the way you are prepared to consume. We have spent, last year, the country of Belize spent about $12 million educating I don't believe farmers. in that. I don't believe in education. I think it and that takes, is what I'm saying. It takes it forever is, it for won't, people to it uh, won't happen. <laughs> if you, 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 you approach a farmer and if he's willing to do it clean, let him do it clean and we test it. We go to another farmer and so forth. The days of spending time of convincing people, in my opinion, are well over. We're wasting no. our time. No, but I am right that just putting on paper so that they are face to face with it and they are doing it, you know, just knowing that they have an alternative. Sometimes it clicks just like that. In the middle of the night, the guy wakes up. I believe in it. So, I have seen it beside me in my bed. <laughs> we don't have too much information. One, don't mind the question at the back. To process it, you know, the information. But also, you know, I was very shy. I introduced myself. I forgot to tell you a very important matter. That you're from France. No, that I have planted 1,000 cacao trees with my little hands, as old as I am, 1,000, and I'm still planting. And they Everybody are giving big. Big fruit like this, and it is totally organic. I wonder why they escaped me, that organization who decided that Belize cacao is not up to pass. Because I'm totally organic, and they did not come to visit me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a question with a young man. Mm -hmm. like last year, I had some Romanian nephews, and I had a nice home. Head. Yeah. You form the head. It's a bit hard. It, it's a challenge, and that is why I, I say we have to have a stall. We have to have a stall, and and. The consumers have to support the stall. They have to make the effort to go to that stall and buy, to keep that farmer going, and to grow that stall. And it has to be done with all of these young people who know about, I know, I'm technologically challenged. These boys here and girls, they know how to tweet and do everything instantly. Where I you, talk. Where are you located at? Because uh, okay. we're looking for people that, that are growing organic, because that's what we want to promote. Look organic too. Oh, thing, little things like that we don't do. Like, do you have a sign, like what the gentleman said, do you have a sign on your gate that says organic cilantro? No. Yeah, but I so, understand oh, that's what people in the market started putting up their signs and it wasn't. <laughs> 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 that's why I'm saying we have to. We set up our own testing lab. No, we don't need to set up a lab. There's a dime a dozen labs. Get, get the product and send it off. Make it easy for yourself. Why do you want to run Sandy, a lab? Labs are expensive. I think we could get a, a list of um, organization labs, local labs, that we could do testing. I think that would be helpful. Because I didn't realize there were facilities up within Belize to do that. There's all sorts of facilities that are underutilized. But Guatemala is literally eight hours away. Yeah. But if you don't have to go that far. You won't go there. You put it on the bus. No, but what I'm saying is, if I had one in Ladyville, why the hell would I go to Guatemala? True. I see your point. And, and I don't know what's where. Why not just send it to the U.S.? You, and that's a, it might be cheaper also. It might be. But that, that's, what I'm, I'm, that's what I'm wondering. And I would rather be local. And when I say local, within Belize. There are certain things that we have to be practical about. Right. To run a, to run a lab is very expensive. Yep. The equipment is just... And it has just to be up to standard and everything has else. To be there, are, there, are, there are labs in the world that this is what they do. Right. This is what they do on a daily basis. Somebody goes to work and they have a bunch of specimens there and that's what they do for a living. There's one in Guatemala. And that's what they do every day. Okay. That's what they do. And the product, you put it on the bus at 6 o'clock at the border in the evening. It's there by 4 in the morning. They pick it up at 6 in the morning. 
the following day you have a printout of your results on email. It's, it's as simple as that. Yeah. Really? There's yeah. no problems with taking plant material across international borders? Or taking what? Plant material across it's international it's borders? It's like sending stuff to the U.S. I mean, it's, it's all dry. Even so, so, that doesn't matter. The dogs in the U.S. You just Guatemala. That's, I mean, there's our for the permanence, right? <coughs> well, and, and that's that, but that's, a, that's the, the questions I have. If there was somebody in Ladyville, I would go to Ladyville if it was twice as much. Just because I could drive over there and I could drop it off and I could see somebody's face. I mean, I'm sorry to say, but I would, even though I'm in the technology industry, I would rather talk to you face to face than email you or talk to you on the phone. There, there's a lot of truth to be said there. Now, I don't know the, 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 the status of the, of the lab because I'm not involved in anything anymore. Yes. But Baja does have a lab. Okay. And in the past, they have done a lot of testing because we did, we did used to export commodities. We no longer export very little, but we did export for a while. Yes. And they do have the testing facilities. And you said BSI or, or the orange? BSI does their sugar. Okay. They test everything. Every, every load of sugar is tested. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know, I understand that, but do they do any outside testing? I don't have any an answer to that. Let's, I don't know let's get all that after the meeting. Okay. I think I can thank you very much. <coughs> You're one of my favorite speakers. Enjoy the rest of the day.